It fluttered awkwardly down out of the skies and stood dejectedly and disconsolately and with bewilderment at the side of Highway I-75 in South Florida. It was a great, huge, bald American eagle, far off course. Nobody knows where it came from. But it wasn't supposed to be in the flatlands of Florida. It was designed for the mountains. Its wings had been injured, according to the Humane Society, which, who treated it well, but that it was unhappy and mixed up it was obvious far from its native heath. Did you ever see an eagle in the mountains? I did once in the Yosemite. It was perched high on a crag. And then with an enormous screech, it spread its wings and took off over many canyons. But now, here it was. That fowl that had illimitable space built into it. Now here it was. Standing impotently by a highway where it didn't belong. Sad story, isn't it? <laughs> you know something? The same God that made the eagle made you and me. And he put amplitude in us, too. We're meant for high places, not for low places. He built into us a thing called a soul. And the soul cannot be held. It wants to grow and to soar. Oh, in a way, you and I are hanging around the highways impotently, living a partial life when we should be living a great life. That's why it's a great thing to get us all here to the church this morning it doesn't say anything in the Bible about it, but the purpose of being here is to make eagles out of you people. And out of me, too. That may be a big job. How do you make a great soul out of a human being? Well, one way for sure is to get that individual to practicing faith. F-A-I-T-H is the word, faith. What would you say is the greatest learning experience possible to a human being in this life? Well, since I'm doing the talking, I'll tell you what it is. It is to learn to have faith. Now, not just to believe in something, but to risk your whole life on it, betting your whole life that that's right. Faith in depth, in full reality. And now, now think what happens to you when you get that. Just think. 
If you have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, I didn't make that up. It's written here in this book, which is the most reliable book ever written, and it never told an untruth. If you have faith, nothing's impossible. That's really something, isn't it? That's what it said. And if you have faith and doubt not, you shall say to this mountain, this great, big, huge adversity, difficulty, illness, weakness, you shall say to this mountain, be ye removed and be you cast into the sea and it shall be done exactly as you say. This is no weak, willy-nilly little faith that we have. This is man-sized. This is woman-sized. This is great. Oh, you don't need to creep in here on your hands and knees and sink into one of these seats and then creep out again. You and I were never meant to crawl through life on our hands and knees. Never! We're eagles. They shall rise up with wings as eagles. That's the idea. And then another thing the Bible says, I came across this the other day in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I hadn't seen it in a long time. And I've been trying to live by it ever since. Here's the way it reads. Trust in the Lord and he will act. That is to say, you have faith and divine action will get going for you. So, what faith will do for you is incredible. If it's real, and it doesn't have to be all that great, just like a grain of mustard seed. Blow it away. But if that faith that you have is real, you have power. Now, I asked you to pray for a man not long ago, a few minutes ago, to heal him. I personally believe that anybody can be healed. There are three ways of answering prayer. Yes, no, and wait a while. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. And he knows best. But people are healed. Like I knew a mixed up person. And I'm not pointing at anybody in this congregation that and at the minute, nor at myself. We're all mixed up one way or another. By mixed up, I mean, you got a lot of fear in you, got a lot of anxiety, got a lot of emotional instability, you got sin and all that, you're mixed up. And not normal. Not whole, not healthy. Well, I saw this person gets faith. And what I saw was the bright and shining scalpel or surgical instrument of faith go down into this mass of stuff in that individual's mind and clean it all out. 
and they weren't afraid anymore. They weren't anxious anymore. They didn't worry anymore. They didn't hate anymore. They weren't emotionally unstable anymore. Clear-eyed, happy face. What did it? Faith. Now, I forgot to mention in that list of messed up stuff, tension. I had a hard time with tension myself. You know, dry, hard drive. When I was a boy, I was taught to strive and succeed. And get there, always be on time, never be a minute late. And I still believe in that. But you know, you can get tense. And when you're tense, it can have a deleterious effect on your whole body. I was in Illinois not long ago, riding through a town, a city it was, in an automobile. And I remembered once years ago, I went there to speak. And it was to be a big meeting. They told me it was the most important meeting they'd had there in a long time. And they sold tickets for it. They're going to have a big crowd. And they sent me a contract to sign that I would be there on a certain day and deliver a 45-minute speech. And they wrote 45 into the contract. Well, it was along about February. And I was accustomed in those days, whenever February came along, to get a cold. And that this cold would go into the vocal cords and completely shut them up. The congregation used to look forward expectantly to February. <laughs> but as sure as February came along, here would come one of these colds. So I got a cold just when I was supposed to go to this town. And I said to my secretary, please call him up and tell him I can't make it. So she called him up and said, Dr. Peel has a terrible cold. His vocal cords won't work. He can't say a word. So you'll have to excuse him. They said, nothing doing. He signed a contract. He has to be there, cold or no cold. And besides, why doesn't he practice positive thinking? So I went out there, and when I got off the plane, I was met by a committee, and they said to me, how are you? And I said, it's fine. <laughs> so, so on the way down, I said, is there a good doctor around here? I've got to have some treatment if, if I'm going to make any pretense at making it talk. So they took me to an old doctor. Now, he could, he must have been... 75 or 80 years of age. And he had glasses like Winston Churchill that he wore down on his... And I said, uh, I, I need help. He says, what's the matter with him? I said, I have a cold. I can't speak. I have to make a speech tonight. He says, what do you want me to do for you? I said, squirt stuff down my focal cord. Paint them. Do whatever you're supposed to do. He said, you think that'll help? <laughs> well, I said, what else is there to do? So he squirted stuff in there and he painted it. He says, what else you want me to do? I said, I don't know. What else is there to do? He said, you want me to tell you why you have that cold? Yes, I said, please. He said, you're one of the tensest men I've seen in a long time. I said, I couldn't be. I preach against tension. <laughs> well, he said, you're tense. And if you could just be calm and let that tension go, those vocal cords would open up all right. They're just a little red. That's all. But that's because you've been straining them. 
I said, how, how do you do that? He said, you go over to a hotel, take off your clothes, and get into bed. And he says, have you got a Bible with you? I said, I never travel without one. Well, he said, spend the afternoon reading it. I said, how about some vitamin C? <laughs> no, he said, you know, there's some great medical men in this world, like my friend Nor Sam Nordoff. He said to me, what you need is the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. And you just have faith in what I'm telling you. I'm going to be sitting on the front row in that meeting tonight. And when you come out there on that platform, I expect to hear your voice flute-like and bell-like. Now he says, keep those two things in mind, flute-like and bell-like. <laughs> so help me. When I walked out there that night, thinking of flute-like and bell-like, I was able to talk. Now, it wasn't what you might call mellifluous, but it was clear. That doctor died a few years after that, but he was my friend until he did. And he used to tell me, he says, if I could get people to practicing the principles of the Bible, faith, quietness, calmness, and peace, I wouldn't have much to do. If you trust in the Lord, he will act. Now, that's a mild case that I gave you. Last summer, August, on an August night, I had dinner with about a hundred people in Yankee Stadium prior to the game. And I was sitting with Commissioner Bowie Kuhn when in walked a pitcher, a famous baseball pitcher of the Yankee squad. He had his uniform on, had his glove. He went over and talked to Bowie Kuhn. Then he came over to me. He says, the pitcher has to go out on the field right away. And he wonders if we could ask the people to stop their meal and pray for his little three-year-old boy who had fallen out of a window, three stories, hit his head on the fender of a parked automobile and had been in a coma for some days. He says the pitcher is a born again Christian. He is a believer and he feels that if a hundred people Christians gathered under the auspices of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes will join in praying for his little boy, that his little boy will be healed. And he says he wants you to offer the prayer. So Mr. Kuhn told the people the circumstances. We all bowed their heads. Pitcher was standing next to him. To me, in an attitude of reverence, his head bowed. And I prayed for a little Travis. Everybody else prayed for Travis. We visualized him well. We put him in the hands of God. And I could hear the pitcher say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We
We said amen. Pitcher went out, pitched nine innings. He lost the game that night. But he pitched it all the way through. Now, how did the pitcher come to believe that you could heal that boy? Back in 1974, he was acclaimed as the greatest pitching find of the big leagues. He was pitching for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Then one night in Montreal, an intense pain went through his arm. He tried to pitch again, and the pain was even more intense. The doctors told him he had a separated ligament. And it affected the nerves in the hand, and the hand became like a claw, like an eagle's claw. And they told him he would never pitch again. But he went to church, and the preacher preached on a text. If ye have faith, even as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible unto you. So he went out day by day. He would take a tape and tape the ball to his hand because his fingers couldn't hold it and he would try to throw it indeed he could only push it two years he did this and other players seeing him in the ballpark said why doesn't the man know he's through somebody stop him but there came a day when the hand opened up and he was able to take the ball, he was a left-hander, and to throw it with the old-time rhythm. And that year, he won 20 games, and he put his team, the Los Angeles Dodgers, in the World Series. Tell him that faith won't change situations. So when I saw him walk out that night, I remembered this claw story. And I said, he believes. Only a few days later, little Travis opened his eyes. And within a short time, was back to normal with no apparent continuing effects of his injury. Now, I know that you can bring up other cases where that didn't happen. But if it happens once, it is an established principle that can happen. So, whatever your problem may be, don't give in to it. In other words, fight it. And how do you fight it? By the fight of faith. Remember that great text in the 37th Psalm. Trust in the Lord and he will act. He always will. He never fails. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatness of the Christian faith, which is no small thing but which is the greatest thought process possible to the human being, whereby we can attack all the evils of society, all the weaknesses and failures of our own life, and gain the victory of faith. And for this, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.